Hi, I'm Anusha Iyer. I'm the uh, co-founder and CTO of a cybersecurity startup in the Washington DC area. And I'll be talking about API secrets and how these are increasingly being used as kind of proxies for machine identity and some of the challenges with that and some of the ways to shore up uh, API authentication and security. Gartner put out its API hype cycle. And so for those of you that are a embracing APIs and API driven ecosystems, you're not alone. In fact, what you'll see here is that there's been a substantial increase on usage and reliance of APIs. And it's really just kind of explosively grown from just even three years ago. So, you know, organizations that are already using or planning to use APIs has gone up to uh, surveyed 98% up from 88% in 2019. Similarly, the usage or plan to use of public APIs from third parties has nearly doubled from 52% in 2019 to 94% today. And private APIs from partners, that usage has gone up from 68% to 90%. And similarly, the usage of publicly exposed APIs, whether that is, you know, directly calling a public API, say like a Twitter API or using um, open source services and so forth, that has gone up to 80% as well. The other key aspects here, and this was a report that was actually put out by two folks at Gartner, Mark O'Neill and John Santoro. So other key aspects is that API technology is really moving beyond REST um, to event-driven APIs and reflecting just the growing awareness and importance of kind of a design-first mentality with respect to introducing APIs into an application ecosystem. And also there are industry-specific verticals that are really starting to embrace these. So things like healthcare, obviously fintech, um, you know, just really vertical-specific API challenges, for example, like open banking. And so this is really, increasingly showing us that APIs are foundational to digital business. And there really is kind of a shift from human to machine, right? There's more and more ever, you know, ever so recently, the traffic that is moving across our systems, across our networks, across the internet is not so much humans logging into systems. It's really systems talking to other systems, machines talking to other machines. So now when we say machine, what do we actually mean? A machine and the way we like to, I, I define it as Corsha is really anything that doesn't have necessarily a human identity to back the access. That could be anything from a Kubernetes pod that is running in a, a cloud native cluster to a Docker container, to a virtual machine, a physical server, even an edge IoT device. For example, we're doing some work right now with the Air Force Sustainment Center where we are trying to facilitate automated communication between industrial IoT equipment sitting on a shop floor and digital engineering platforms running in the cloud. Right. So that notion of that piece of IoT equipment doesn't have necessarily a human identity always backing and supporting access to other systems. Similarly, microservices, right, um, wherever they may be deployed. And in this uh, in this talk, we're largely going to define machine like this, really, where it's no human identity backing it. And when you think about recent regulations that have come out, things like zero trust, for example, right? So these frameworks really frame machines as what they term non-person entities, right? And so when we talk about machines, let's take it a step further. How is machine identity handled when it comes to um, API-based access? Right. So really, when one machine makes an API call to another machine, how does it identify itself? How is that authentication and that access verified? Well, today it's primarily three different methods. It's either API keys, right, with, which are easy to generate, but static and long lived, rather dangerous to use if they get, you know, because they can easily get into the wrong hands. API tokens, which can have standard token formats like JSON web tokens or OAuth tokens, for example. They can be short lived, but 
essentially they're rooted in static secrets. So to request a fresh short-lived OAuth token, you have to obviously authenticate to an OAuth server, right? Similarly for a JSON web token. And so those static secrets backing the tokens still become points of vulnerability. And then another, you know, kind of mechanism often used for API authentication is mutual TLS. So mutual TLS allows you to set up not just server side verification, but also client side verification. And the challenge here is that key management is brutal at scale and with third parties, right? There are some technologies out there that are coming out to handle mutual TLS and, and facilitate easier workflows that we'll talk about later. But particularly if you're looking at communicating with third parties or doing this at scale, cert certificates are challenging to keep them short-lived and do basic hygiene, things like rotation, revocation, et cetera. Now, so we have these three different mechanisms for machine identity. So what ends up happening here? What are the, the concerns? The concerns are really that these API secrets are just really system passwords. They often get shared. They're rarely rotated, often set to never expire. They can get leaked, sprawled, sprayed across a number of different environments. So think about, for example, you know, your own uh, DevSecOps or CICD pipelines. How many of these tools that you're seeing here do you touch? And if that pipeline is fully automated, all of that communication is happening over APIs and those API secrets that are placed in order to facilitate the communication become points of target, right? And their static nature makes them ripe targets for adversaries. So just to point out that this is not a theoretical risk, it's actually happening today. We're really finding you know, in a lot of our discovery that APIs are in fact the new target. So for example, you know, GitHub reported a breach where an attacker breached dozens of organizations using stolen OAuth tokens, right? And it was really um, based off of a vulnerability in Travis CI. So they were issued to Heroku and Travis CI. And Travis CI is a, uh, a CICD, um, essentially deployment tool that allows you to automatically build, deploy, publish artifacts. Similarly, MailChimp, this is one where uh, threat actors gained access to API keys and then used them to breach hundreds of accounts, right? Again, dark reading, Travis CI leaves free tier users open to attack. And this is an interesting one because what happened in this instance is that Travis itself inadvertently logged the um, account tokens and so forth. And so these logs were loaded with GitHub, AWS, Docker Hub account tokens. And because they are, you know, essentially um, subscribed to the bearer model, if you have a token and it's valid, you can essentially use it from anywhere, right? And the best that, uh, an individual that has issued this token to, can do is revoke the token and reissue, but you have to first detect it, right? And so it's that idea that we need to move past that bearer model of authentication for APIs, just like we have on the human side, right? When we talk about human identity access management, we no longer rely just on static passwords. And so let's look at some new models for API identity. Right. Certainly there are better ways to store these secrets, right? So there are key management systems, whether they are built into your cloud provider, like an AWS API gateway or, um, you know, Azure's KMS, sorry, AWS KMS or Azure's KMS, or whether it is, you know, a HashiCorp vault where you're using kind of a third party key management system. That's certainly a step forward um, towards better storage of these secrets, right? Um, other models are really redesigning your API ecosystem, potentially, you know, your microservice architecture as a service mesh, where then you have infrastructure 
to actually provide service level identities between the service meshes and there is a control plane where you can do more of a policy based um, service level access management right and that's a great step forward when you're thinking about internal apis and within a particular network or ecosystem where you know really you're constructing this microservice architecture to provide a larger service outwardly. And then, as I mentioned, there are efforts out there like Cert Manager um, via JetStack that has substantially improved certificate automation for uh, Kubernetes-based ecosystems where you can provision, allow the certificate manager to provision and maintain guarantees around short-lived certificates. Again, this is great for an ecosystem where you control all of the services inside of the ecosystem um, and great for working within Kubernetes clusters. So really, the, the goal here with a lot of these, and perhaps collectively, right, is really to make machine identity a first-class citizen with human identity and access management, where we move beyond more... Um, you know, dated notions of things like service accounts, static API keys, and are able to provide more zero trust based guarantees where we can say, okay, if this API call comes from a machine, um, we can still assert and verify even using something like one time use tokens that it is in fact a machine that I trust, right? Whether that's a Kubernetes pod, whether it's a container, a VM, IoT equipment, you really want that ability to have the same level of control, fine-grained visibility, observability over machines that you have with humans. And so let's take a look at kind of just a new concept. And this is something that, you know, we are spending some time on at Corsha is when we think about human identity and access management, what really move the ball the furthest in terms of protecting against, say, uh, you know, password credential stuffing attacks, right? When you think about the days where you had the massive Yahoo breaches and so forth, what really helped shore up that issue with passwords and with um, trying to get users, human users, to maintain good hygiene around things, rotate passwords, password policies, all of that, was really taking the control back and not relying on those end users to maintain the good hygiene. And we accomplished that with MFA, right? Now, suddenly when you have an MFA a token or an authenticator or an extra factor associated with that password, even if the password's stolen, there's really minimal impact there, right? And so what we propose at Corsha is that same concept, but for machines. So the notion of creating a dynamic machine identity rooted under the hood, still in certificates and PKI, but really abstracts away the PKI and that base of certificates to allow you to do things like have one-time use API tokens, right? And really pin access to only trusted machines. And then because of the way the machine identity is done, have fine-grained control and visibility over these machines. So let's say, you know, a Splunk alert comes in on a particular uh, edge device or on a particular Docker container that is running in AWS or Azure, for example. It would be great to have that control to be able to say, okay, that machine right there, I'm going to, you know, uh, either temporarily or permanently turn off its API access, give an analyst time to investigate and mitigate any impact to the, um, the services and the network as a whole. And then also to have automated security hygiene so that your DevSecOps folks aren't having to rely on manual processes for maintaining hygiene, token rotation, certificate rotation, and so forth. And so this is something that, you know, we're really um, exploring and hoping will get the same level of adoption as human MFA does, is really taking the onus off of manual security hygiene and just automating the whole thing so that you can maintain guarantees in an automated fashion. So 
let's take a look at some of the takeaways here, right? So here are just some suggestions to hopefully um, give you some tools, tips, techniques to improve your own API security, API identity and access management posture. So when you're thinking about DevOps, DevSecOps, really try to accentuate that that security aspect to it, right? So build security into roadmap design, deployment, ops schedules, particularly if you have a greenfield type product, right? You really have the ability to, to design in things like service mesh architectures. And if you're looking at existing um, deployments, existing API driven ecosystems, really consider how to bring in that idea of expiring short lived tokens and periodically, whether it's through ops calendars or whatever mechanism you use, have an audit of service accounts, right? Have an audit of when tokens or when API keys expire and, and have policies around them so that you can, can confidently say you are not using a token that lives perhaps longer than a month, right? A second um, tip that I'll give you is to scan static artifacts. Now, if you're using something like GitHub, for example, there's some built-in scanning that happens, but really take a shift left approach of making sure that you catch leakage of API secrets and misconfiguration. Right. And there are some tools out there, Git Guardian, for example, Truffle Hog, that will do this. Scan your code repositories, scan, say, your Helm charts, your Docker files, and so forth, and make sure that you haven't inadvertently checked in, say, an AWS API key. And similarly, you know, another layered defense approach to it is in, you know, uh, number three, use an API gateway. That is really a uniform way to handle authorization, access to services with things like rate limiting, policy enforcement, and, and so on, where then you can kind of elevate the security guarantees and posture that you're taking. And each individual development team within your organization doesn't have to come up or implement with their own ways of doing this, right? And there are some great options out there. So Kong, for example, Apigee, MuleSoft, um, Software AG, they all have API gateways that, um, and certainly your cloud providers as well, all have kind of native API gateways that gives you that uniform service or API level access um, into your ingress. And then finally, layered authentication, right? Um, that is a great way to get defense in depth. Don't rely on just one factor to provide that protection. Really look at a layered approach and ideally one-time use credentials. So maybe that is a a mutual TLS plus an API token, or maybe that is whatever your primary factor is plus Corsha. But it's really that idea of, you know, elevating API access, identity management as first class into your overall cybersecurity, your overall um, DevSecOps infrastructure and pipelines and, and perspectives. Because, you know, if we take uh, a snapshot of this and take actually audit how much traffic is coming into our networks. I think we would all find that as, um, you know, Akamai has kind of put out recently in their state of the internet reports, for example, over 80, 90% of the traffic is actually over APIs. It's not necessarily humans connecting into systems. And so this notion or this segment of, of cybersecurity really needs to be elevated and shored up. Thanks so much for taking the time to listen to me today. We are in fact a development fund partner with Venify and are working on some pretty fun efforts around um, both integrating our technology as well as exploring some of the API security concerns around Istio and how to shore those up. Thanks so much and hope everyone has a great day.